Okay. <clears throat> this is the start of volume 23. Uh, the latest volume that was pre-ordered, uh, I think it was volume 27, I think. Uh, that ended up coming out, and I pre-ordered it, so I got it right away. So, yeah, you guys, once I get to that point, I'll be able to do that video. Or start that volume, I mean. But we're starting volume 23. Which essentially is volume, part five, volume two. Prologue. Many of Ob Aaron's box scholars were gathered together with Ferdinand, previously a resident of Aaronfest and the fiancé of the next Archduchess, in the office he had received in Aaron's box castle. This is data regarding the Adolgis of Princess, one said, an emissary from La Lon Lonzenov, I don't say that often enough to be able to write, say it right, Londonov arrived in the summer and consulted us regarding her being sent over. The king will need to be informed of this during the next Archduke conference. Are they like the port for Londonov to show up? Because, I mean, why are they showing up in Aaron's Bog of all places? Why not in the sovereignty, like, capital? Is there? Is it because it's just, you know, the ocean? I'm assuming it's because they have the ocean right next to their country, and thus they get all the ports in the other countries, you know? It'll make sense. An adultess, a princess, Ferdinand muttered unpleasant thoughts stirring within him. He recalled that Roblet, the sovereign knight commander, had noticed his unique history as a former seat of Adolgesa. It was possible that others had here knew the circumstances of his birth as well. A uh, small possibility, but if they did their research enough and consulted the knight commander, the sovereign knight commander, about it, they would have known. The scholars continued their explanation, unaware that Ferdinand was acting so guarded. You may not know this, as you are from another duchy, but Adolgis of Princesses come from Lanzanov. Please read these more detailed papers on how she will be received. Their duty was to bring Ferdinand up to speed with his responsibilities in Ehrensbach, and they carried in stacks of documents and paperwork one after another. Ditlende, as the next archduchess, needed to prioritize dyeing the foundational magic with her mana, so Ferdinand had to take on most of the administrative work. I can understand why the scholars would rather work with me than Lady Detlinde. I am better accustomed to bureaucratic work, but my duties educating Lady Letizia are just as important. Detlinde had not done anything even remotely close to paperwork until very recently, in part uh, due to her being the youngest daughter of Georgine, who had previously been the Duchy's first wife, third wife. In fact, Detlinde had previously been further from the seat of Ob than any other Archduke candidate trailing behind the second wife's two sons, her brother, the third wife's son, and Letizia, the first wife's granddaughter from Drawankel. In the end, however, the Purge had seen that second, the second wife's two sons reduced the arch nobles. Delende's older brother had perished in an unfortunate accident. I wonder what accident that was. And Ab Ehrensbach had died before Letizia came of age. Delende was thus having to serve as a temporary archduchess. So what is Letizia almost seven? I know she's been baptized, but she's eight at this point so if she's eight she's got seven more years to go the scholars informed Ferdinand that the late Archduke had not done much to educate Detlinde as he did, had not wanted her to stand above the younger Letizia still to think that I would be the one sending a Lanzanoff princess to that villa Ferdinand started reading the provided documents he felt a sharp unmistakable bitterness knowing that he would need to be consistently involved with Lanzanoff and Adolgesa but he kept his true feelings from showing. His eyebrow did not so much as twitch. Oh, I thought it was rather cold today. It seems the snow has finally begun to fall, one of the scholars remarked, their voice somewhat bright. Ferdinand turned to look outside. Indeed, there were flecks of white falling from the sky. The scholars gathered at the window, suggesting that snow was rare in Ehrensbach, but this was a common sight at the start of every winter in Ehrenfest. He returned his attention to his documents. I'm assuming it's because they live their Ehrensbach is by the ocean, and thus it will be a bit warmer than Ehrenfest? Maybe? Which is weird, considering they're right next to each other. You would think that the temperature would be about the same, no matter which, which uh, duchy you're in. Our duchies share the same seasons, but winter here is very different than an Ehrenfest. Justice muttered aloud as he brought over some tea. Ferdinand understood this as Justice's way of proposing that he take a break, so he put down his pen and accepted the cup. Upon hearing Justice's remark, Sergius, one of the Ehrensbach attendants assigned to Ferdinand, blinked a few times. Different how, he asked, his yellow eyes betraying his interest. The gathered scholars were looking at Justice as well, clearly eager to hear about the dissimilar dissimilarities 
between their two duchies. In Arenfest, we see our first flurries at the end of autumn and the start of winter, around when we first came to Arensbach. By now, the streets will already be thick with snow, and the people will be taking shelter indoors at all times. We spend our winters differently as well, Eckert added. Socializing thrives at the castle, but knights need to focus on training and preparing for the Lord of Winter hunt. There is no Lord of Winter in Arensbach, which alone makes a considerable difference. Those listening made intrigued noises. As there was no Lord of Winter to hunt in Arensbach, the Duchy's knights did not put special effort into their training. The most significant difference might be in how we use our winter playroom, Justice said. I was surprised to see that Arensbach seldom uses its own outside of when students are being moved to the Royal Academy. In Arenfest, the adults tend to be busy over the winter, in part due to the Lord of Winter hunt, so the stu children too young to attend the Royal Academy spend all day in the winter playroom as to stay out of their way. Those in Ehrensbach had no need to socialize intensely and gather information before the snow grew unreasonably heavy. Adults in particular were afforded a lot more flexibility. Nobles rarely spent all day in the castle, and children accompanied their guardians while socializing instead of spending their time in the winter playroom. Even the Archduke candidate Letizia, whom Ferdinand was working to educate, had prioritized strengthening bonds with the others in her faction. I was also surprised to learn that winter socializing is only done in the afternoon here. In Arenfest, to make the most of the uh, brief window we know have to socialize, we come together and mingle from morning to night. Arensbach nobles came together in the afternoon when it was warmer. During the winter, they tended to stay inside until fourth bell and started their day after lunch. Unless they were invited to, to lunch, that was. In contrast, during the summer, when the sun beat down mercilessly, nobles barely went outside between third and fifth bell. To accommodate the usual Aaron's box schedule, Ferdinand would spend his mornings doing handover work, then educate Letizia and do the socializing expected of the next Archduchess's fiancé in the afternoon. Still, this lifestyle offers much more leeway than I expected, Ferdinand said. I wish to use this opportunity to ask for your guidance. Hold on. Let me just make sure that this is actually recording. Okay, good. The late Ob Ironsbach had already passed away by the time Ferdinand arrived at his new home, so Ferdinand was worried about a great many things. For now, however, it seemed that everything was proceeding smoothly. The ever-annoying Detlinde had returned to the Royal Academy shortly after his arrival, and Georgine was holed up in her villa, in mourning for her late husband. So he had not seen her at all during what socializing. Furthermore, the scholars who had served the Archduke were being surprisingly cooperative with the handover of work. For now, at least, they seemed to value and greatly respect Ferdinand as a hard worker and the fiancé of their next archduchess. It was a source of great relief, but also somewhat harrowing. This could not be more different from what happens in, happened in Arenfest after father ended up succumbing to his illness. Might we ask what you mean by this opportunity? You are all scholars of Ob Arensbach, are you not? Ferdinand said. I assume you will work beneath Lady Ditlende when she returns from the Royal Academy and takes her place as the next archduchess. In other words, Ferdinand could only focus on handover work during the brief period when Detlinde was at the Royal Academy. Rather than prioritizing a groom from another duchy, their focus needed to be on educating Aaron's box next to Archduchess. The scholars exchanged glances, then all gave troubled, telling smiles. Lady Detlinde is not nearly educated enough for us to work under her, one said. By the time she catches up, I expect Lady Letizia to have come of age. Wow, she's that behind? Jesus! Well, then again, they didn't want her being the next Archduchess because they were prioritizing Letizia. So, of course she's going to be behind. Though, I imagine she could catch up really quickly if she was a hard worker like Rosemine is. But, from what I gather, she's not. We might have thought otherwise if she at least took the work seriously. Yeah, this is what I'm saying. Added another. But oh, how she hates studying. Though she were o may only be a temporary archduchess, I would expect a bit more, well... Although there was some criticism of the next archduchess, it was immediately followed by more genuine, generous words of understanding. She is underage. Plus, as the third child of a third wife, she has not had the opportunity to receive a political education before now. It would be cruel of us to demand too much from her. <laughs> Indeed, indeed. Not to mention she will only be holding the position of Ob for a short while until Lady Letizia comes of age and marries Prince Hildebrand. We do not want her to become too attached. Is her lack of interest not ideal for us? She might not be interested in pol politicking, but she certainly has a lust for power. Ferdinand dismissed the thought at once. Naturally, he could not criticize the woman who is to marry for royal decree here in public. That said, his interactions with her during the few days between his arrival in Ehrensbach and her departure for the Royal Academy had been enough for him to confirm that she had a personality that was painful just to think about. 
From what I've heard, apparently she is like a narcissist. Which is not good when you have someone in power. Okay. Um, if you guys haven't already subscribed, I recommend doing so. Hit the like button if you enjoyed the video. And if you want, you can become a channel member for less than $3 a month. Or you can go to Patreon and donate for a dollar at least. Depends on what you are. You can do a super chat in this premiere whenever I premiere it. Anyway, and so Ferdinand merely nodded along with the scholar's remarks. Start striving to understand their thought processes and personalities as much as he could. It would be better not to speak. He was still pretending to dote on Linde and offering his own thoughts would only result in him lamb lambasting her with utter sincerity. The scholars were criticizing their next archduchess with slight grins, but she was one of their own. If someone from another duchy attempted to join in, then it was possible they might take offense. We are in no position to start being soft on Lady Detlinde and treating her like a child. She may not come of age yet, but she will be very soon, so that serves as no excuse. She will also be participating in the next Archduke Conference as a knob. Even if she is only holding the position temporarily, being the knob is by no means easy. To be honest, I am truly grateful that you are here, Lord Ferdinand. I do not know what we would do without you. And let us not forget how Lady Georgine has abetted this. She did not resist being moved to her villa. From there, the focus of the scholars' conversation quickly turned to Georgine. Ferdinand listened closely, comparing their words to what he had learned from Justice. It was a surprise to all, especially how she, after she failed Chalice as a mono to get old Workstock on her side. Yeah, right. She did not fail those Chalice as a mono. If that's what I'm thinking of, that was Rosemine and Ferdinand who did that. So yeah, that was not her. I thought she would cling more tightly to her newly obtained power. As I understand it, Aaronfest ceased offering its support. Was that ju was that not just Aaronfest shifting to support from Lady Georgine to Lord Ferdinand, though? Justice remarked casually, Ob Aaronfest is closer to Lord Ferdinand than he is to Lord Lady Georgine, after all. The scholars nodded, agreeing with his logic. Ferdinand drew his brows together in the slightest frown. Georgine had more influence with the workstock and the northern provinces boarding Aaronfest than Sylvester and the others realized. Although we are both members of the same archducal family, Lady Georgina and I have hardly seen one another. I thought that we might socialize a bit more now that I'm here, but I have not seen her since our initial greetings. Georgine's lack of presence was almost disturbing considering that she was the late archduke's first wife. She was also very familiar with Justice, meaning that not even his disguises could get him in near her villa. Justice had even said that Georgine had once boasted about being able to see through his cross-dressing. Oh, that's not good. Ferdinand continued to listen to every word the scholar said about Georgine until there came a sudden knock on the door. Excuse me, said the messenger responsible. This arrived from Raymond in the Royal Academy. Raymond was serving Ferdinand, not just as his disciple, but as his retainer in Ehrensbach as well, although they were more like mentor and student than lord and retainer. He was lacking in mana and spent all his time in Herscher's laboratory trying to make magic tools as efficient as possible. Initially, Ferdinand had spoken to Raymond simply because Rosemond had taken a liking to the young student. He then accepted him as a disciple as a means of observing him while simultaneously gathering information on Ehrensbach. By this point, however, Ferdinand found reading his unique perspectives and answering his questions uh, be, by letter a source of great comfort. Sergius accepted the box from the messenger and then opened it. Inside was a sound recording magic tool. Oh ho, is that an improved version, one scholar asked? Its face stone seems to be exposed, another added. Ah, there is also a letter from Lady Rosemine. We'll read this first if you do not do not mind. I do not mind in the least, Ferdinand replied, preparing himself as the scholars took and started going through the letter. They were checking for anything dangerous while also looking for any hidden messages or the like that they would need to censor. That fool, what has she written this time? In her previous report, Rosemine had described the state of Herscher's laboratory, inadvertently informing the scholars that Ferdinand had been a burden on the professor during his time at the Royal Academy and that he had become so absorbed in his research that he had neglected to eat, clean, or eat properly. Oh my god. The scholars had laughed at Rosemine telling Ferdinand not to live so unhealthily in Ehrensbach, which had made him want to tear up the letter on the spot. Unfortunately, the hidden report she had written in Shining Ink was much too important, so he had needed to refrain. One scholar read through the letter while the scholars began checking for any patterns or phrasing that might have signified a, ro a code. Of course, nothing they did make the Shining Ink appear, thank god. Ferdinand checked Raymond's magic tool once it was given to him while listening to the contents of the letter he read aloud. Ferdinand had tasked his disciple with making a smaller and more mana-efficient sound-recording magic tool. The first prototype had been small enough to rest on one's palm. 
an improvement over the standard model that required two hands, but Ferdinand had sent it back, saying that it could be made much smaller by taking away the lid. Now the lid was gone, exposing the face stone used to store the recording. All in all, the magic tool was fairly well made. Upon starting our joint research project with Ehrensbach, Professor Herscher told me that my strengths are my mana capacity and my brewing skills, one of the scholars said reading Rosemind's letter aloud. Thus my role is to create prototypes based on the designs that Raymond comes up with. Ah, I was wondering how he finished so quickly, but I see that Rosemind is the reason. Raymond was short on mana even for a men noble, so while he was quick to draw blueprints, his progress was slow considering considerably when it came to creating the prototypes. This one had arrived much sooner than expected, evidently thanks to Rosemind having brewed it. Raymond was helping to realize the things she wanted, so there was nothing wrong with her helping him during the cre creation process. The details are written in the report I sent to Professor Frawlarm. Hmm? Have you received a report about the joint research project from Aaron's box dormitory supervisor? Not to my knowledge, Ferdinand turned to the attendant behind him. Sergius, Justice, have any retainers visited while I was absent? No, my lord, Sergius replied. A report from a dormitory supervisor would not have been sent to your guest chambers in the first place, so there would never have been a risk of it arriving while you were absent for socializing or the like. That was the obvious answer. Any letter sent to Ferdinand would first need to be inspected by the relevant personnel in Ehrensbach. It was unthinkable that he could have received a report without the scholars here knowing. Hmm... Then we will need to question the dormitory supervisor of scholars that we do not want the joint research to be delayed, nor do we wish to trouble Ehrenfest. Understood. After that section of the report, which had more or less called out for alarm, came the topic of a tea party for bookworms hosted by the royal family. Rosemond had eagerly gone along with the idea, despite it meaning she would need to socialize with the very people she had continuously been told to avoid. One could easily imagine her restraint going straight out the window the moment books and libraries were put before her. Still, to think Lady Rosemine was invited to such a tea party, one scholar said with a sigh. If only Lady Ditlindy were to socialize with royalty a bit more. Some bemoaned the fact that an Ehrensbach Archduke candidate had not received an invitation, but an Archduke candidate from the lower-ranked Ehrenfest had, while others were more interested in the sweets that were described as having been, having been served. So, Dunkelfelger produced new sweets with the recipe it obtained, hmm? We purchased the same recipe during the Arstu conference, so perhaps we could try making something with our specialty fruit as well, Lord Ferdinand? Would you happen to have an eye for what would suit pound cake? Well, as mentioned in Rosemine's letter, I have little interest in food, Ferdinand replied. You would be much better off entrusting this question to a chef who is familiar with Aaron's box sweet fruits. They were asking him to make new sweets, but Ferdinand had no motivation for that. Rosemine made new sweets and combined unique flavors because she had an unusual attachment to food. An attachment that Ferdinand did not share. He suddenly recalled that she had once said to him, if you want to eat tasty food, then train your own chef. If she were here now, perhaps she would be adapting Ehrensbach's highly spicy dishes to suit her own tastes. I borrowed books from the Sovereignty and the Palace Library. The scholar reading out Rosemind's letter continued. The one that Professor Solange lent me was from a closed stack archive and certain research contains research about Schwartz and Weiss. I will inform you if we make any new discoveries. I see. To think she would be allowed to borrow a book from a closed stack archive, another scholar muttered. I suppose it would come as no surprise, given that she is both a disciple of Lord Ferdinand and a regular visitor of the Herscher Laboratory. The scholars continued to praise Rosemind for a reason that Ferdinand would never have expected. According to their explanation, the valuable contents of the closed stack archives were only lent to those whom the librarians considered particularly intelligent. Everyone else would simply be told that it was too soon for them to read such things. Ferdinand had not known this since his request for such books had never been refused. However, times had changed. Now there were drastically fewer librarians at the Royal Academy, and numerous magic tools in the library were no longer being supplied with mana. In its current state, the library was able to perform the duties for which it had originally been constructed. The place was more akin to a glorified study station. There was a sta chance that the library would improve somewhat with the arrival of the new arch librarian, but it would still be a far cry from its former glory. The scholars here likely did not know how dramatically things had changed, that, or they merely did, could not understand it. This time, I managed to endure the whole thing without collapsing. I've grown so much, wouldn't you say? It's all thanks to the potions you made for me, Ferdinand, and that is the end of this letter. Having failed to find anything unusual, the scholar attempted to pass the letter to Ferdinand. However, Ferdinand waved away, waved away the correspondence and said, I am short on time. There's nothing I must re urgently reveal or reread, re and my reply can come later. Sergius, store the letter in my chambers with my letter from Raymond and the magic tool. For now, let us resume our duties. Justice, take this tea away. After announcing the end of our, their break, Ferdinand picked up a pen and returned to his paperwork. 
Oh, yeah, because he couldn't take it from him because that would have revealed the, the disappearing ink. That night in his chambers, Ferdinand started on his response to Rosemine. He had yet to read the hidden message that her letter doubtless contained, and there were too many retainers nearby for that, so he focused solely on his public-facing reply. Only after Seven fell when most of his retainers had gone would Ferdinand take out the shining ink. He would wait until Eckert was on night watch, but even when his time would be limited, the knight was particularly concerned about his lord's well-being and would swiftly call on him. Ferdinand skimmed the letter and then put his head in his hands. How does she keep getting involved with royalty like this? I don't know, man. First, Eglantine and Prince Anastasius had declared that Rosemont had been the one to bless them during their graduation, and to avoid further unrest, they had asked her to serve as the High Bishop and blessed Prince Sigiswal for his starbine ceremony. The response had not come at unreasonably in a reasonably short notice, and there were various factions involved, so neither Rosemine nor Arendfest were in any, any position to refuse. At the same time, however, the Sovereign Temple was involved, and the ceremony being held during the Archduke Conference would draw the attention of every odd from every duchy, alongside that of various other key nobles. Not to mention, Rosemine had personally confessed that one of her reasons for accepting was that she could be present when Ferdinand and Ditlande had their own star binding. Please stop. You will only end up blessing me more than you do the prince. Ferdinand was certain of that outcome. Rosemont had already said that he was like family to her, and it was simply simple to predict that what trouble an emotion-driven blessing would create. Some of those who had seen Eglantine receive her blessing had started to argue that she should take the throne. So imagine this scenario. Ferdinand, after being accused of vying for the throne as a seat of Adolgisa and moving to Ehrensbach to indicate his loyalty, received more blessings than the, from the gods than anyone else. It was not a pleasant thought by any means. I mean, you would have been married by that point, dude, so... It's not really that big of a deal. At the very least, she will want Hartman with her. Hartman had the sharpest eyes and the keenest mind out of all Rosemond's retainers. With his assistance as a high priest, Rosemond will presumably find things much easier to deal with. Next, there was the matter of the triple locked archives keys. Ferdinand had given Rosemond free reign with her library committee business under the assumption that her work would consist only of regularly visiting the library and supplying its magic tools with mana. Having her take ownership of one of the keys was far from good. After all, that underground archive contains so much information leading to the Grudgeshite. Ferdinand rubbed his temples, recalling the text and the magic circle that had arisen from the High Bishop's Bible. He had never been the High Bishop himself, so it had not even occurred to him that such a development might occur. Rosemond was rarely close to the group was surely closer to the Grudgeshite than anyone in the royal family, and if she were to enter the underground archive, the Ferdinand was quite confident that her book-oriented curiosity would result in her obtaining it. But how could I prevent her from going near the archive? As he pondered this, his eyes fell on one line in particular. Once the librarian has inspected the inside, I'm allowed to read whatever books it contains, he frowned. There were severe restrictions on who could enter that archive. It was managed almost entirely by magic tools, with the illit librarians were merely safeguarding the keys. It would not be strange for Professor Solange and the new librarian to be unfamiliar with this rule, as the former has never been able to go inside. But how is the royal family still in the dark? They should be visiting the archive more than anyone. Ferdinand had thought that maybe the royal family was deliberately keeping this knowledge to themselves due to the purge, but in reality they had simply lost the knowledge altogether. The royal family only had themselves to blame, but not even that explained the extent of their ignorance on the subject. It seemed more likely that someone in the royal palace was, mit was restricting the flow of information or concealing documents. But should I say that? Ferdinand was in Ehrensbach precisely because he was suspected of wanting the Grushashite. He did not want to invite any more suspicion, nor did he want to get involved with royalty. Unfortunately, that no longer mattered. Rosemite had gotten involved with the royal family and the underground archive against his will. If anyone came to realize that he was hiding information, then he would only be placed under further scrutiny. Although I may not have the Grutrishite, it is the Zen's duty to maintain peace, no matter how ephemeral it often proves to be. The king had said at their meeting. Ferdinand was a seed of Adalgisa, and Arifes had not assisted the king during the Civil War. These two facts alone had aroused suspicion that they were seeking to claim the throne, and Trollkull expressed that he could not ignore the risk of Jürgensmith once again being ravaged by war. Ferdinand had, could not fault the man for his decision. After all, it was the same conclusion any good king would make. By indirectly informing the royal family of what awaits them in the underground archive, I should be able to keep Rosemine away from it. 
He could send information about the underground archive to Rosemont, which would reveal to the royal family that she was providing him with intelligence. And as Rosemont was an Archduke candidate of a duchy already suspected of treason, the royal family would immediately start treating her with more caution. She would be forbidden from entering the library and most likely removed from her position as owner of one of the three keys. They had gone as far as to send Ferdinand to Aaron's box, so they would absolutely refuse to let Rosemont anywhere near the archive. And that is what matters. To Ferdinand, keeping Rosemont away from the underground archive was more important than anything else. That was why he was even willing to explore the royal family to make it happen. The words and the magic circle that had arisen from the High Bishop's Bible, one look at them was all anyone would need to conclude that Rosemont was unconsciously drawing closer to the Grudgeshite. I do not know how much she will be able to resist when, be, when put before a document-filled archive, but I will emphasize my warning nonetheless. If the royal family does not already know about this, then they must be made seek aware. You are not to approach the archive yourself, however. That will only cause problems. After finishing his response, Ferdinand let out a heavy sigh. Just let this strange cooperation end there. Please. He was asking both Rosemine and the royal family. Don't let it happen, please, what are you saying? The royal family and the library. Oh boy. As I was waiting for the royal family to summon me again, I decided to be proactive. First, I created a questionnaire for the Dunkelfelger Apprentice Knights, helping with our joint research. My scholars made all the necessary copies and prepared the answer sheets for me, and through this process, they learned the general format of a questionnaire and how to make their own. Moving on, I purchased the schematics of the improved magic tool from Raymond since I had received a passing grain from Ferdinand. I could use them to make one of my own. The tool itself was compact enough to be held in a single hand, and while the standard version played its recording when the lid was open, this one simply required the recipient to touch the exposed face stone, not to mention it could record several messages instead of just one. However, the more messages you want to record, the stronger a face stone of wind, earth, and life you will need, Raymond noted. That won't be a problem. The Earth at Arenfest's gathering spot was rich with mana, perhaps because of how frequently I was regenerating it. Plus, according to the Apprentice Knight's reports, the increased quality of our ingredients meant that the Fabies coming for them was growing stronger as well. At the moment, the Knights were hunting there daily to tra in, as training for their upcoming dinner game against Dunkelfelger, forced upon us by our joint research project. I needed only to buy the face stones I required from them. Uh, I wish I could buy face stones that easily, Raymond groaned. You will be able to soon. If others want the magic tool deta detailed to these schematics, then I will put you at pay you an information fee. Raymond had received my explanation of royalties with a look of absolute confusion. Huh? But you've already bought the schematics, Lady Rosemine. What's all this about? Schematics such as these that are bound to see such wide and extensive use are worth the extra cost, are they not? If we do not foster good relationships with our researchers and compensate them well, then I do not believe they will stay motivated. Your idea is very wonderful indeed, Lady Rose, my Raymond said, his eyes sparkling. Hersher looked just as amazed. It seemed that they were only used to one and done seals. I promptly started making my own sound recording magic tool, listening carefully to Raymond as he talked me through the process. After stepping in some face stones, I was finally done. Could we perhaps put this in a stuffed toy that speaks of one touches the head or stomach, I asked? If you keep the face stone exposed, yes, but what will be the point of that, Raymond replied, tilting his head at me. Beside him, Lazleta leaned forward, her deep green eyes sparkling with enthusiasm. A stuffed toy that would speak upon being stroked would be wonderfully cute, would it not? She said, just imagine it. I know, right? I replied, then I keep thus in keeping with our tradition, or my tradition, I shall make it a red pan. It has to be a shoe mill, yes? That will certainly be the cutest, Lazleta interjected, giddy with excitement. She then fixed me with an unyielding stare. Do allow me to assist with making the stuffed toy. Unfortunately, I was far from being a talented seamstress, so I swallowed my suggestion that we should make the sto stuffed toy a red panda and went with a shoe mill instead. Red pandas are cute, but there's no helping this. It'll be hard to make things like that on your own. Days passed and we soon reached the date of our meeting with royalty. This was a summons rather than a tea party, so I only had to prepare enough sweets to present as a gift. Our load was light, but my heart was heavy. I did not think I would end up returning to their villa so soon, I said. But Hilda gave you a troubled smile. You were all the one who decided to inform them of what you could have been what could have been kept private, Lady Rosemine. There was a report from of Ob Aaron Best agonizing over this as well, Riarda added, looking equally equally strained. 
However, if this information will aid the royal family even the slightest amount, then it would not be wise to keep it from them, my lady. I am of the opinion that your decision was just and ideal. My retainers had heard of the royal family's struggles from Anastasius before the tea party for bookworms. They are, were very sympathetic to the current king, who was running himself ragged trying to supply money to the foundation, despite having never been raised or educated for his position. Apparently, they saw his situation as similar to my own, comparing his ordeal to my grueling work supplying Mana and Arifest, to Arifest as the Archduke's adopted daughter and the High Bishop, despite having been raised in the temple and not receiving a noble's education. Though I doubt I'm struggling even half as much as King Traraqual. Unlike the royal family who didn't know what to do after losing such crucial information, I was receiving the expert guidance of so many people, I was truly blessed to have them. It's maybe a summons from royalty, but at least it's with Prince Anastasius, I said. He had graciously forgiven me for all my previous blunders, whether it was reading too deeply into his interest, intentions with Egontine, or collapsing in his presence. Knowing that he wouldn't suspect me of treason or planned usurpation when I told him what I knew made this a lot more comforting than if another member of the royal family had summoned me. Do not let your guard down, my lady, Riarda chided just as we arrived outside the door to the villa. Oswald was there to welcome us inside. We have been waiting... Uh, Lady Rose might have Aaron fast. We were taken to a room where three people were sitting in wait. Among them was Hildebrand, who had met me with a smile, and Anastasius, who quickly mumbled, She's here. Oh boy. Between them was someone I didn't recognize. A man with light golden hair like Anastasius and deep green eyes complimenting a peaceful smile. The clothes he was wearing and his position between the two princes immediately told me who he was. Hey, it's the first prince! Come on, Prince Anastasius! You should have warned me that he was going to be here! Crap! It's Prince Sigiswald! This is not good! She's meeting the crown prince! Not good! <laughs> not good, not good, not good. I definitely hadn't expected Sigiswall to be present. I shouted complaints on the inside, but this was a summons, not a tea party. There was no reason why Anastasius would have informed me who was participating. I smiled and greeted both Anastasius and Hildebrand, resisting the urge to crumble to the ground in despair, then knelt before Sigiswald and lowering my, lowered my head. It is an honor to meet you, Prince Sigiswald. May I pray for a blessing and appreciation of the serendipitous meeting ordained by the harsh judgment of Ava Glaive, the god of life. You may. I am Rosemine, an Archduke candidate of Arenfest. May the threads joining us never be broken. I granted Sigiswald a blessing, taking care not to go too far. Then acquired his permission to stand. From Even though he was seated, I still had to look up to meet his gaze. He seemed to be a very calm, serene individual. A complete contrast to Anastasius. There was a diligent air to him, and I could tell that he was the kind of person who paid attention to matters both big and small. Making him feel very much like a well-raised first son. He hardly, ca hardly came across as someone who would have fought Anastasius over Eglantine for the throne. Maybe he had just been their retainers doing the fighting? I don't know. Maybe. Who knows? Sigiswald looked me in the eye, maintaining his pleasant smile. So you were this Rosemine I have heard so much about. The saint of Arenfest, wise enough to have come first in class two years in a row, but of such poor health that you missed the award ceremony on both occasions. I have long wanted to meet you. Well, the second one was kind of a... I kind of had a really good excuse for that one, considering uh, the attack on the, uh, on the, on the Interdoji tournament. So, yeah. Kind of had a reason for that one. I was looking forward to both ceremonies and deeply regret that I was unable to attend them. Many have described it to me as an honorable occasion where one receives direct praise from the king. I was trying to make it clear that my absence hadn't been deliberate and I adopted Angelica's signature look of disappointment in an attempt to really sell it. No way could I admit that I had skipped my first ceremony after Ferdinand baited me with reading time. If you do not mind, I would like you to take a seat and tell us what you know about the library's archives, Sigiswald Swall said. We of the royal family truly do require even the faintest of slivers of information you may have. I glanced at Anastasius and Hildebrand. They were both looking my way with interest, but Sigiswald was watching me a lot more closely. He maintained a peaceful smile, but I could feel the quiet intensity of his gaze. Answer our questions honestly, the first prince continued. The archive locked by three keys can only be entered by members of the royal family a selection of Archduke candidates, and the library's magic tools. Furthermore, it contains documents that we of the royal family need to read. Is this correct? I cannot say for certain, I replied, speaking honestly. No sooner had the words left my lips than I noticed Anastasius plant a palm on his forehead. Rosemind, whatever do you mean by that, Sigiswald asked, wrote, blinking at me. I informed Arenfest of my taking ownership of one of the archive's keys and reported my delight at having the opportunity to read any documents confirmed safe for me to view. 
But the response I received was this was that this made no sense. I do not know much else, so I cannot verify anything without actually entering the archive. I see. And Astasia sighed and said, You remain too honest for your own good. Evidently, I should have sugarcoated my response a little better. But I mean, they literally told me to be honest. Still, this is rather strange, Sigiswald said. What do you mean? Why is Aaronfest the only duchy that knows all of this archive requiring three keys? Not even the greater duchies of the sovereignty itself were aware of it. I couldn't help but cock my head at him. Surely there was someone who knew. A member of the royal family who survived the purge, for example? Did the last professor who was teaching the Archduke Canada course not know, I asked. Her husband seemed to have visited the library at a young age, but no, she did not. We consulted Al Klasenberg and Dunkelfugger as well, but neither has ever stepped foot in the Royal Academy's library. I already knew why Archduke candidates didn't go to the library. They would need to bring their, their train of retainers and would end up monopolizing the corrals, which would inconvenience everyone else. In general, the Royal Academy's library was considered a place for lay nobles and men nobles where they could study books they could not afford to buy or to make money by transcribing them. It was for these reasons that my retainers often advised me against going to the library. But I truly loved reading there, so I had no intention of stopping. I was only avoiding it this year because I was busy with all of our research, and the handover process for Shorts and Weiss was progressing slowly. Normal Archduke candidates have their apprentice scholars fetch whatever books or documents they want, so they have few reasons to visit the library themselves. Or sorry, I'm told. Perhaps that is to blame? Are the Archduke candidates of your duchy told to visit the library personally, said Jaswald asked, sounding ever so slightly amused. Realizing that I had just insinuated that Aaron Fest and Archduke candidates were abnormal, I averted my eyes. I go there readily because of how much I adore libraries and books. My siblings, Wilfred and Charlotte, rarely ever go themselves. She's telling the truth, Hildebrand said. Rosemary just loves books, that's all, and she was going to the library so often to supply Schwartz and Weiss of Mana. His explanation didn't seem to stop Sigiswal from viewing me as a weird Archduke candidate, but I was grateful that he had to try and gave him an appreciative nod. There is an Aaronfest professor who has dedicated her life to research, and one of her past disciples was an Archduke candidate, whom she often sent to the library on her behalf, I explained. It did not help that this particular Archduke candidate had few retainers who he could trust, and therefore could not risk letting anyone else handle the books he needed. <sighs> The three princes all responded with exceedingly uncomfortable expressions. Maybe I had said too much. As far as I'm aware, it was a simple coincidence that he learned of this archive, I continued. He muttered something about wanting certain documents, so Schwartz and Weiss took him there to read them. The arch librarians unlocked the archive for him without any fuss, so perhaps it was not a particularly secretive location at the time? We had no way to confirm this. The arch librarians from back then were no longer with us. But if the archive really had been a royal secret, then surely Ferdinand would not have been allowed inside. I visited the Royal Academy's library often and regularly interacted with Schwartz and Weiss as their master, but I was still unaware of the archive. I said he must have been seeking very specialized documents. I had asked Schwartz and Weiss for books that I hadn't read before, but not for any specific kind of documents. Thus, the books in the reading room were always enough to satisfy me. It is possible that Schwartz and Weiss would take me there after I exhaust every book in the reading room, and then in the closed stack archive that anyone can borrow from, I noted. But considering how little time remains before my graduation, I cannot see myself ever accomplishing that. I had deliberately refrained from saying who had given me all this information, but as expected, Sigiswald and Anastasius had still deduced his identity. Sigiswald continued to smile, but there was now a glint in his dark green eyes. Why did this individual keep such vital information to himself for so long? He did not know that the royal family was unaware of this archive. Upon learning this, he told me to tell you, which is why I sent that ordinance. In fact, he also said the royal family's lack of knowledge on these subjects is so unnatural that he suspects someone has been deliberately been hiding things from you. Ferdinand naturally understood that what I was saying would make me seem suspicious, but his, the information was important enough that he had determined it best for me to proceed anyway. In my opinion, it would be far more constructive if we dropped this conversation entirely and they went to the library to do some research themselves. There is something I wish to ask of the royal family, I said. May I? Hold on, Anastasia said, trying to stop me before he could protest any further. Go ahead, Sigiswald interjected, nodding at me. I smiled at him and then said, You went out of your way to summon me here today, but what exactly do you hope to learn? Is it who told me this information, or the contents of the documents that he said the royal family should know, perhaps? As I have not entered the archive myself, I will not be at all useful regarding the latter. Oh boy. 
stir ran through our retainers. Anastasia said, you speak above your place, while Stigiswald merely stared at me. Regardless, this discussion was clearly a waste of time. The diary of a past librarian that Solange allowed, you to allowed me to borrow said that members of the royal family visited the library upon coming of age, and that all the arts librarians gathered to welcome them. It seems plain to see that going to the library was once an important process for the royal family. That said, the Sovereign Knight Commander confiscated that diary some time ago, so I would assume you have all read it and already understood the understand the importance of the archive. In essence, I was trying to say, if you have the time to ask me where I got my information from, then you might as well just go to the library yourselves. This message seemed to have been heard loud and clear as Sigiswald exchanged a look with Anastasius and nodded. If all of the arch librarians gathered to welcome them, then it really is likely that they were going to the archive of which we speak. If we go ourselves, then we will know whether the information whether within truly is valuable, Anastasius. Right, I shall summon the Dunkelfelger Archduke Carrot to the library, Anastasius said. He instructed Oswin to send an order to Oz to Hanalor, but I quickly called out before Oswin could. Oswin, please ask Lady Hanalor to bring rejuvenation potions. Rejuvenation potions, he repeated. I nodded. I am told that registering with the keys requires a significant amount of mana. Better safe than sorry, no? I recall Hort do recall Hortensia saying something along those lines, Anastasia said. Oswin, do as she suggests. Oswin sent the ordinance, and a response from Handelor came soon after. Understood. I will make my way to the library now. She was informed that the princess were going to be present, then we began our trek to meet her. We stood out so much on our way to the library that I wanted to flee, but as a soon-to-be owner of a special key, that was hardly an option. Thankfully, we were all weren't all walking together for long. The adult prince quickly marched ahead, moving much faster than my short legs would allow. I gave a relief sigh as they gradually got further away, and it was then that Hildebrand called out to me. Unlike his half-brothers, he was deliberately matching my pace. Just like Lutz. Do you know what's in the archive, Rosemine? he asked. I am told that it contains documents about the Archduke Canada course and old rituals, including one particular ritual that Arifest was investigating. Our Ob visited the library during the Archduke conference, intending to see them, but Schwartz and Weiss said that he could not enter due to nobody having the keys. I was hoping to make the royal family understand the importance of the library and perhaps even convince them to send over a few more arch librarians. Hildebrand clapped his hands together and smiled, looking as though he had just come up with a brilliant idea. In that case, we could use this opportunity to look through the documents together. That's a very attractive idea offer, but my guardian has forbidden me from entering the archive so that I do not cause any further problems. I didn't want to make Arifest seem any more suspicious, and avoiding the archive entirely was the best way to prevent any blessings explos blessing explosions from occurring when I entered. I understand that from a rational perspective, but I'm still dying to go inside. The desire was so strong I wanted to read everything in there. Riyarda likely wouldn't let me, though, and Ferdinand would be mad beyond words. When we arrived at the library, Schwartz and Weiss came over and greeted us. Rose might hear. Hildebrand, too. To my knowledge, this is the first time they call me by name. It wasn't unexpected, but it did feel very strange. To be honest, I was a little upset that I wasn't their milady anymore. Thank you for coming. We have already cleared the library, Hortensia said. Naturally, she and Solange have been informed that we were coming. I silently extended my sympathies to all the students who had been dragged away from their studies, but this was far better than being dragged into any troubles with the royal family. While we were exchanging greetings with the librarians, Handler arrived. Her red eyes widened in shock when she not saw not just one, but three princes. As if getting summoned by Prince Anastasius wasn't bad enough. I know how you feel, Handler. I really do. I was surprised, too. Handler went on to exchange first-time greetings with Sigiswald, after which he said, I apologize for the abrupt summons, but I must ask that you assist us as a member of the library committee. I will gladly provide as much assistance as is required, she replied with a smile, not faltering even the face of such a sudden request from a member of the royal family. As expected from an archduke candidate from a greater duchy, I could learn a lot from her. The keys are in this office, Hortensia said as she guided us there. However, there is not enough rooms for everyone to enter. We must ask that you each bring only two guard knights and one scholar. We had three princes and two archduke candidates in our group. It made sense that we couldn't be able to bring all of our retainers into the library. I chose Lenore, my arch, arch knight. Lorenz, since he was the best close quarters fighter out of all the guard knights with me, and Feline, who was most accustomed to scholar work. These are the keys to the underground archive, Hortensia said, once we were inside, setting each one on the table with a loud clatter. She had found them in the large librarian's rooms in the do library dormitory, and they needed to be registered with different people. Lady Rosemine, Lady Hanalor, please take a key each and start channeling mana into them. Handler and I did as instructed, gripping the keys and registering our mana with them. It wasn't unlike registering my mana to the key for the Lut Bible, so I finished it in no time at all. 
That was rather quick, Hortensia remarked, staring at me in surprise. I smiled and I why thank I smiled and said why thank you. Handler similarly finished channeling Mana into her key a few moments later. Once again, I am reminded of the gap between Archduke Candidates and Arch Nobles. Hortensia, they are both superb Archduke Candidates. You must not compare yourself to them, Solange interjected, trying to console her. She then took out two keys from a storage box and, and explained that they were for opening the closed stack archive and the door located within. I never thought that day would come when I would welcome the royal family and use these keys. According to Solange, the arch librarians had handled everything whenever the royal family came to the library. She had stayed in the shadows, directing attendants to make tea, prepare meals, and carry out other tasks of that nature. With the keys in hand, we made our way to the reading room where we were reunited with our retainers who had been waiting outside. We then cut to the first floor of the library, our numbers having swelled in size once again. The book I lent Lady Rosemine during our tea party for bookworms came from this very close check archive. Solange said with a nostalgic smile while opening a door at the very back of the reading room. This was going to be my first time going inside and my heart raced at the very thought. The slightly dusty air mixed with the scent of parchment was heavenly. Once everyone was in the not-so-large archive, Solange opened another door further into the room. Lights instantly turned on behind it, and a staircase descending down into the basement came into view. It seemed rather bright, maybe because everything was white? So Schwartz, Weiss, please guide everyone, Solange said. Outside, guide everyone. Important work. Schwartz and Weiss began to hop down the stairs. Hortensia, please enter first. As a med noble, I can go no further. Direct any further questions you may have to Schwartz and Weiss. Hortensia descended the stairs as requested, and the princess followed after her. Just like Solange, some of our retainers were also unable to continue onward. Several of the prince's men noble retainers similarly ended up hitting an invisible barrier that blocked their path. Those of you who cannot descend await our return in the reading room, said Jaswald instructed. Once the three princes and their retainers were on their way down, Handler followed. I was last as per the duchy rankings, and not all of my retainers were able to come with me. Feline and Roderick were blocked, for instance. By the time we reached the stairs, only Riarda, Lenore, and Brunhilde remained. I had considerably fewer arch noble retainers than Handler and the royal family. You certainly have many med nobles in your sir and your retinue, Lady Rosemine Handler said, turning to look at me as we continued down the stairs. I have two siblings already attending the Royal Academy and a younger brother who is soon to join us. We are having to battle for retainers at the moment. I suppose that is common for duchies with so many Archduke candidates present at once. Indeed, it has not been a problem for the most part, but I am to see now that there are times when only arch nobles can accompany me, I said, making a troubled expression. This is all very new. Handler smiled and noted this was, this was her first time experiencing it as well. We descended the faintly, faintly illuminated pure white stairway until we arrived at an equally pure white a reception hall, large enough that it could have accommodated all of our retainers at once. The interior was furnished with several tables and chairs as though we were about to have a tea party, but the walls were bare and there were no carpets or other such decorations that one would expect to see in a duchess tea party room. The floor was simply white. I looked around the pure white space and noticed that one wall was actually a more metallic color. On it were three e equidistant protrusions, each decorated ornately as if to emphasize its presence. Three line up. Open lock. Schwartz and Weiss patted the metallic lock wall and pointed at the decorated protrusions. It seemed that the wall was actually the door to the archive, and the decorated protrusions were the keyholes. A closer look revealed that rather than inserting the bit of the key as with a standard door, the entire key needed to be pushed into a mold. I exchanged nods with Hortensia and Handelor, then we pushed our keys into their respective slots. Hold the key, Schwartz said. We did as instructed, making sure our key didn't fall out. As soon as all three were in place, there was a clicking sound, and the face stones with which we had registered began sucking at our mana. They flashed, then red veins started running across the wall. Get away, Weiss said. I slowly retreated until I could see the entire wall. It was covered in magic circles with complex patterns. Once the magic circles were complete, the wall split into three sections, which began to turn with a loud creaking sound. These doors slowly moved out 180 degrees, and once they seemed to connect again, they disappeared. Behind them was a place that did indeed look like an archive. There were bookstands, writing desks, and many bookcases. One would expect these shelves to be packed with wooden boards, but they were instead lined with white slates. There were only 20 volumes of what appeared to be books resting on the desks. As everyone stared ahead in surprise, Schwartz said, Opened, and went inside. Hortensia tried to follow, but she was halted by an invisible force just like the one at the stairway. I cannot go inside after all, she said, stopping in place and pushing against the barrier. Weiss looked up at her and plainly said, Milady not qualified. I wish to see if Archduke Caritas can enter, Rastasia said. Rosemine, go inside. It pains me to say this, 
But my guardians forbade me from going into the archive, I replied, holding back the urge to cry. If we find, if you find anything that I'm allowed to read, then please bring it out here for me. Why shook his head. No lending here. What? That can't be. I thought that I would get to read in my leisure. So mean. I was not the only one horrified to hear that. The books couldn't be lent out. Hortensia was practically trembling with a hand over her mouth in shock. At this moment, Pre uh, Professor Hortensia and I are one. Upon seeing Hortensia and me slump our shoulders, Anastasius gave an exasperated sigh and turned to the other arch candidate present. Very well then, Handler, go inside. Understood, Handler replied, albeit after a short pause. She took a deep breath, steeled her resolve, and slowly walked forward with a hand gingerly extended. She would enter the archive without incident. Schwartz said something to Handler once she was inside, and I could see her tilt her head in response. The barrier must have blocked sound, as we couldn't actually hear them. It seems our two candidates can enter after all, Anastasius mused. Well then, brother, I will go in first. After checking for danger, Anastasius turned back to the entrance and nodded. Sigiswald joined him not long after, but their retainers collectively failed to enter. Me next, then, Hildebrand said with a bright smile, moving to follow them, but as he tried to step forward, an invisible force stopped him. Oh, no! No! He couldn't go in either! How? He inhaled sharply and started pounding on the bear. Why would not it let me through? Why only me? Is it because I'm engaged to an Ernsbach Arstu candidate and won't be royalty forever, he cried at the verge of tears? Why shook his head? No, Hildebrand, not enough mana. Hildebrand wasn't the only one to harden in response to this news. His present retainers exchanged glances, unsure of what to say to him. I made my way to the youngest prince. For sure, Wyatt had said that he didn't have enough money to enter the archive, but that was nothing to be upset about. It is written that those of the royal family who came to this archive did so after coming of age. There is no helping that you would not have enough money when you have not even entered the royal academy. You have not yet learned to compress your mana, and you have not been granted the divine protection of the gods, and you have not even obtained your staff. Rosemine, you have yet to finish your growth period, that is all. Now, why not wait with me? I gesture to the ta chairs around one of the tables. Hildebrand scanned the room, looking at the tables and chairs before the invisible wall. You're going to be waiting here, Rosemond? As much as I would enjoy entering the archive, Ob Arenfest has forbidden me from doing so. Still, we can see inside from here, can we not? I imagine this is where our retainers would normally observe their lord or lady to ensure they are not in any danger. I intend to have some tea and wait to hear whether any important documents truly are located inside. I will join you then, Hildebrand said, contently making his way over to one of the chairs. His head attendant author started in relief, then gave me an appreciative smile. Brynhilda, please consult Professor Solange about preparing tea, I said. I understood, she replied, then gracefully turned on her heel and ran up the stairs. Or started up the stairs. Upon seeing this, the other retainers started making proper preparations of their own. Prince Hildebrand, I similarly wish to prepare tea for you, Arthur said. May I? Please do. Brynhilda returned with only a portion of what she needed for my tea. I returned to the dormitories with Lays Linda, but this is all I could carry on my own, she said, where the troubled smile. In that case, take a moment to breathe. Riara said, then went back upstairs to fetch the rest. I nodded in agreement. You may rest over there once the tea has been poured. Oh, no, Lady Rosemont, I mustn't let you out of my sight. You might charge toward the archive at any moment, Brunhilde giggled. Lenore noted that she shared this concern. Apparently, they couldn't trust me when I was watching the archive so closely and practically buzzing with anticipation. Okay. But, I mean, there's an archive filled with books and documents I've never seen before, literally right there. Of course I'm going to fidget. Basically, anyone in my position would have a hard time keeping still. If they loved the books as much as you do, then yeah, they would. Since the door could only be opened with all three keys, it was impossible to say when another opportunity like this would arise, if at all. Of course, I was struggling to hold my urge to read. Hildebrand sipped his tea, sighed, and then looked at his hands. What can I do to raise my mana capacity, he muttered, pursing his lips. Mana compression isn't taught until the Royal Academy, so there's no need for you to fret about this now, I said. Put your capacity will swell once you find a technique that suits you. Plus, the royal family must have an effective method researched by generations of kings, surely. It was apparently normal for mana compression methods to be treated as secrets kept to oneself in one's house. I was sure that the royal family had their own. It also seemed wise for me to avoid giving Hildebrand any tips, as I could guess that he would rush to try any method that I told him about. For that reason, I settled on a vague reply and turned my attention back to the archive. Handler and the others must have been trying to get a general idea of everything in the archive. They had split up and were taking out the white slate-looking documents, skimming them, then putting them back where they had found them. Handler shook her head, and the two princes were frowning. Then Anastasius looked at a big, open book on a stand and called Sigiswald over. 
God, I wish that were me. It looks so fun in there. I wonder what that big book is. I continued watching while munching on the sweets that Riarda had brought us. Soon enough, Handler and the two princes exited the archive while discussing something. Um, Lady Rosemine, could you please join us for inside for a moment, Handler asked. There are so many ancient documents and we are struggling to tell what they are about. Given that you can read Dunkelfugger's history book, I imagine that you are very familiar with ancient languages, are you not? Rosemine said just while I added, until it, although it pains me deeply to have you break a promise with your guardians, might I request your help also? My heart wavered. I wanted to go in. I wanted to read all those unfamiliar books so, so much. But I didn't want to get yelled at. Um, but I, I, um... I turned to Riyard and Lenore, seeking their permission. They both looked at me with concern, then lowered her, their eyes, signaling, signifying their refusal. Hildebrand was also giving me a pleading expression, not wanting me to go without him. Rosemine, come, Anastasia said authorita authoritatively. You must not use such a demanding tone, since Wald interjected. She is already cooperating out of the goodness of her heart. Anastasia shook his head. You have the wrong idea, brother. Her guardians and Erinfest have placed a very clear restriction on her, so she cannot enter unless we give her an excuse in the form of a royal decree that supersedes their orders. Yep, yep, you can't defy a royal order. You can't. So if she's ordered to come in, then they can't say anything. Thus, Rosemine, assist us in reading the archive's documents. This is an order directly from the royal family. An order from the royal family? Well, my hands are tied then. Woohoo! Riarda, Brunhilda, Lenora said, returning my attention to them, I can hardly refuse an order from the royal family, can I? They collectively sighed. Milady, anyone can see that you are beside yourself with excitement. I agree you cannot refuse an order from the royal family, but you must not get too excited, Lady Rosemine. Indeed, there was no refusing a royal decree. I stood up from my chair with a smile and said, allow me to go then. But with that, I eagerly stepped through the invisible barrier. Rosemine force looked up at me, head cocked. Not enough prayer. Hmm, what? I asked, blinking in confusion. Handler followed in after me. Oh, did Swartz say something to you as well, Lady Rosemine? Yes, he said that I'm not praying enough or something of that sort. I do not understand it either, but I was told the same. Not enough elements, not enough prayer. The princess had apparently received identical messages. We ponder what it can mean, but Anastasia merely shrugged and said, If not even Rosemine, her duchy's high bishop, has prayed enough, then there will be no point thinking about this any further. Maybe it's they don't ha pray enough in the library? Maybe? Because she does enough praying outside the library. There was no point musing any longer. It was time to read. Wait. Prayer and elements. Are they talking about... The, uh, shoot. What the, uh, the temple fundamentalist or whatever the heck they are. Was that what they're talking about? When the king has to... Live and pray to the gods a lot. Is that what they're referring to? Because that's the only thing that would make any kind of sense to me. And if so, why is that pertaining to Handler and Rosemine? And the other two for that matter. Anyway. True, now let us begin. There was no point musing any longer. It was time to read. My hands first went for a book resting on a nearby table, but Anastasia stopped me and instead took me to a shelf pack of white slates. The books there are written in relatively modern language, he said. We can read those just fine. just fine. You begin here. Handler said you can read this language, Rosemine, but is that truly the case? Did Wald asked. Anastasia just pulled out and then handed me one of the lined up slates. It was made of the same ivory stone as the building itself, and there was ancient text carved into it. These would never degrade, for as long as the Royal Academy and the library were supplied with mana. Stone slates, hmm? Very well suited for preservation, though they, they're a bit heavy and you can't fit much on them. I ran a finger across the letters as I read them. This is the process for performing a fairly ancient ritual. Hmm. So this is that part of the Bible, this is what that part of the Bible was referring to. It was a ritual stemming from a story about Leyden Shaft's subordinates, who once got into such a heated fight that they created a blistering summer. In the end, they had, it had fallen to Berfurimer. Berfu, I cannot say this! Berfurimer, the goddess of the oceans, to cool their heads. In the same sense that Haldenzell's ritual was meant to bring forth summer, this one was meant to contain excessive heat waves. The Bible contained illustrations and the necessary lyrics for the ritual, as well as the story from which it had come. But this slate had actual instructions for performing it. If a similar slate existed for Haldensell's ritual, then we would probably be able to recreate it. 
I am particularly in personally interested in this subject and would like to research the connection between the Bible and these rituals, I said. However, that is not what the royal family is looking for right now. I will check each in order. Schwartz, so please bring them to me one by one, starting from the leftmost slate. On the top shelf. Right away. I read through each slate that Schwartz brought me. Meanwhile, Stitches, Wall, and Anastasius went through the relatively new information recorded in proper books. While well, Handler tried to read the ivory boards at a much slower pace. After reading about various rituals, I was finally handed one about something else. Prince Sigiswell, Prince Anastasius, will these be of use to the royal family, I said. These are the memoirs of a sovereign from long ago, describing their mana compression method and what divine protections they obtained. The latter parts, in particular, may also prove useful for our joint research with Dunkelfelder. The memoir seemed quite official in nature, but it was essentially a how-to book explaining how the author had become sovereign peppered with a healthy number of complaints about the hardships it all entailed. However, it seemed that details considered to be common sense were omitted, most likely because of the limited space. There are some spots that I cannot grasp the meaning of without this context. Such as what? Give us a literal translation. This part reads, I circled around and around offering prayers to all the gods, but where would they have been circling? And what were they, how were they doing it? Were they performing a dedication whirl or something? Is there a place to circle around in the sovereignty, I asked, firing off one question after another as I envisioned the former sovereign whirling around in prayer. Anastasius frowned. Given your status as a high bishop, I do not think there is anyone in the Royal Academy who knows more about prayers than you. Is there nothing in the temple that would explain this, that is, offering prayers while circling something? I imagine it prefers not to spinning, but to repeating a route and praying to various gods, such as while coolly suggested. Thus vanished from my mind the image of a spinning king. <laughs> I have been seriously concerned about the practice of this ancient culture, but going to various places to pray to various gods made complete sense. That said, when I offer prayers to the, in the temple, I either have the divine instruments brought to me or I go to the chapel, I noted. And not once have I needed to circle any routes to offer prayers to certain gods. Wait, are they talking about spring prayer? Where you travel... A uh, where you circle around this country and offer prayers to the gods? Is that what they're talking about? Sure, I traveled all across Aaronfest for spring prayer and the Harvest Festival, but I prayed to the same gods everywhere during those. As I mulled over the phrasing of the text, I suddenly remembered something that Monica had said. Ah, one of my attendants in the temple once said that there are statues and carvings of the gods all throughout the building. If every temple is the same, perhaps those of the past had to walk around praying to each god as they went. That may be it, Anastasia said, frowning once again. So just well give a contemplative look. As this memoir seems valuable, I must ask you to translate it into modern language and provide a transcription for us to reference. A direct interpretation can always be done later by scholars, but I am confident that your translation will prove the most accurate, owing to your familiarity with the temple and prayers. Understood. In that case, I will return to the reading room to acquire pr paper and some ink from Feline. I said, naturally, my scholars cannot come to me. Allow me to send forward instead, Handler interjected, raising her voice. You're the only one familiar with this ancient language, Lady Rosemont. It would be best for me you to stay here and continue checking the documents. I shall speak to your attendants for you. I, I cannot ask you to do that, Lady Handler. Sending the Archduke Canada of a greater duchy on an errand for me was out of the question. But even as I desperately shook my head in refusal, to just walk on it with a smile. We are very grateful for your offer, Handler. Take some time to rest once you have spoken to Rosemont's attendant. You have been working tirelessly since we arrived. Oh, right. She needs a break. I could easily become so absorbed in my reading that I'd neglect meals and even sleep, but other more normal people needed to take breaks. That much had completely slipped my mind. I watched as Handler exited the archive, then looked back down at the white slates. Rose Mines just well said, It has come to my attention that you are doing research on the acquisition of divine protections. Is it true that you can obtain more through prayer alone? There is without a doubt a direct connection between prayer and obtaining divine protections. There are various conditions, however. One must pray often and sincerely, and generously offer up mana, for example. The apprentice knights from Dunkelfelder, who are known for obtaining the divine protections of Leidenschaft and Angriff, will play a crucial role in identifying how important each condition may be. <sighs> Sigiswald sighed, looking down at the former sovereign's memoir. I obtained divine protections from all the primary gods whose elements I possessed, but did not feel any significant changes. At most, my mana has become slightly easier to use. So what changes when one obtains the protections of subordinate gods? I find myself torn over whether I should prioritize prayer or the duties expected of the current royal family. By that, he probably meant that he couldn't afford to be reading documents in an archive when he needed to nigh constantly supply the mana required to support Jürgen Smith. 
Prince Sigiswald, even when time is of the essence, it is wiser to take the safe detour than the dangerous shortcut. I can only recommend the more reliable option here. What do you mean? I smiled. It may seem time-consuming to focus on compression methods, spend time here reading documents, and try to obtain divine protections through prayer, but in the end, things will only improve if you have more mana and protections. One's mana efficiency increases ex significantly when one has the divine protection of many subordinate gods. How significantly, he asked, his dark green eyes widening. I imagine it depends on the individual, but my older brother Wilfred obtained the divine protection of 12 gods in total and said that he can now brew things with using about 70% as much mana as before. 70%? And how exactly would, how much would one need to pray to obtain these results? There was a biting intensity in his eyes. That alone told me just how much pressure the royal family was under and how desperately they needed mana. You obtained more protections than the brother of yours, correct? Anastasius asked with me with a glare. How efficient did your mana become? Ah! Uh, to where I can't control it anymore? <laughs> I pressed my lips together. Was this a question I should answer, or was hiding the truth more important? Either way, the royal family needed to learn the effects of praying. If you intend to announce the effects of praying in the temple at the introductory tournament, then there is no reason you cannot tell us here. I was planning to minimize my presence during the announcement, as I am much too I am too much of an outlier, but as I wish for the royal family to understand the importance of prayer, I will speak honestly. Not even Aaron Fest knows the precise number of protections I obtained, however, so please keep this to yourselves. Anastasius looked at Sigiswald, and they both nodded, considered a promise. I was granted divine protections from 43 gods in total, and my mana expenditure dropped to perhaps 40% of what it used to be. For brewing and supplying mana, I used less than half as much mana as before, to the point that I've even been struggling to manage it properly. Less than half, Sigiswal cried out in shock. Just how much have you been praying? I must insist that you keep this to yourselves, I stressed, then wrote down a prayer on my diptych. In Arenfest, we pray to the gods when supplying mana to the foundational magic. I am told that even Ab Arenfest was granted the divine protection of multiple subordinates due to this practice. As one needs only to chant this prayer while supplying mana, perhaps it will be ideal for the extraordinarily busy royal family. Is that really it? Anastasius asked, eyeing me suspiciously. Of course. If you wish for a true abundance of divine protections, then you must proactively visit the temple and perform religious ceremonies. The sincerity with which you do these things is also important. However, I expect that your being members of the royal family leaves you without the time or the leeway this would require, and you would doubtless butt heads with the sovereign temple. If you were to suddenly take charge of their ceremonies, instead start with the very basics. Before you know it, you'll be praying so naturally that blessings will spill out on their own. That's what happens with her. Right now, the priority needed to be getting used to the process, although it was possible that some would view them strangely or get mad at them even then. I had experienced that myself. I have yet to verify this with my own research, I said, but it seems that divine protections can be obtained even after coming of age. If you all pray regularly while supplying mana, then things should be a lot more comfortable for you a number of years down the line. Even after coming of age, just how much information is Arenfest hiding? We were not hiding any of this. Before I performed the ritual for obtaining divine blessings, I thought it was normal to pray when, with, to pray when supplying mana to the foundational magic. Plus, pretty much all the information they thought we were hiding had come from Ferdinand. He was the one who had been keeping it all a secret, if anyone, although I naturally wasn't about to say that. Lady Rose, my hero, the paper and ink you need. Handler said upon her return, stationary in hand. I accepted it with a polite thank you, then got straight to work translating the Sovereign's memoir. Next, we shall take a break ourselves, said Jaswal announced. Handler, my apologies, but I must ask you to transcribe this board onto, onto paper. Understood, Prince, said Jaswald. I watched the two princes leave the archive, then sighed in relief. Handler exhaled in turn and gave me a gentle smile to think that Prince Anastasius' summons have resulted in our being here with not one, but three princes. It was quite a surprise to see them in the library, would you not say? Indeed, I could not believe my eyes when I saw Prince Sigiswald, though I saw him in the prince's villa before we came in the library. I also did not think I would be tasked with transcribing things, Hanalo continued. I assumed that I would only be asked to help open the door. Ancient language is not a specialty of mine, so I am heartened to have you here with me. I must say I am impressed by how much you can read, I replied, keeping up with a brief exchange while working on my translation. Not even those of the royal family seem to have much of a grasp on ancient language though they are prioritizing their other duties. Oh, this seems to be a ceremony for royal succession, Handler said all of a sudden, peering at the slate in, his hand, in her hands. Something like that would never be done in Arenfest Temple, so I took a peek myself, my interest drawn. I am fairly confident in my assertion, as it says here that the new sovereign must present their Grudgeshite, but no, I think you are correct. This does seem to be a succession ceremony. 
I wonder how the current king succeeded the throne when he doesn't have a Krojashite. Such questions drifted into my mind. Hanelo gave me the slate, having determined that it was of new use, no use to the current royal family, and asked Schwartz to bring her a new one. I went ahead and read the slate a little more closely. During the royal succession ceremony, the high bishop would apparently wear the crown of the goddess of light. Maybe because she presided over promo promises and contracts? Wait, is this a spell? The slate also contained what seemed to be an incantation for storm transforming one's staff. I copied it onto my diptych. Ferdinand definitely came here all the time. I bet he made it his mission to read absolutely everything. Slates containing information on other rituals, similarly detailed spells for making the god of darkness's cape and the goddess of earth's chalice. I had wondered why Ferdinand and Ferdinand alone knew so many random things, and now I had my answer. I'm going to read everything, too. After reading until the library closed, I returned my key to the office's storage box. My time in the archive had taught me a lot about various rituals, as well as the spells needed to turn my staff into any divine instrument that I desired. Pouring over so many documents and absorbing so much information had already made me, almost made me drunk with the satisfaction. I was actually starting to waver on my feet. The archive can be opened as long as we three key holders or key owners are present, I said, but, and without any members of royalty present, there would be no need to clear the library of students. Thus, in place of the busy royal family, I shall return here often to continue my reading. Such is my intention, but both Riarda and Anastasia swiftly shot me down. That will not do, my lady. You will have many other things to prioritize, such as your joint research projects with the greater duchies. Furthermore, we cannot risk you entering an archive inaccessible to your attendants while without someone of higher status to drag you out. Your attendant speaks wisely. We cannot allow you to enter alone when you have become so intently focused that you ignore even our calls. Not to mention, you only ever made progress on the transcription when we kept a close eye on you. Otherwise, you became too absorbed in your reading. I desperately searched for someone to back me up, but to no avail. Everyone was in agreement with Riarda and Anastasius. How could this be happening? I don't have a single ally. I turned to Sigiswald, the highest authority in our group. If anyone could save me now, it was him. He looked at Hortensia and Hanalor with a peaceful smile. I hereby forbid anyone from entering the underground archive until we of the royal family call again. Hortensia, Hanalor, you must not use your keys, no matter how many times Rosemary may ask. Ah, oh, he's not on your side either. <laughs> Understood. We had just discovered the most fascinating archive, and we had barely even skimmed the surface. Yet here I was, forbidden from accessing it for the foreseeable future. I was so disappointed that I trudged my way back to the dormitory, feeling empty. Upon our return, Riarda started tearing into me for all of my mistakes. My offenses included giving Sigiswald half-baked answers while keeping my eyes glued to my documents and clinging to them so tightly that Anastasis had needed to tear them out of my hands before evicting me from the archive so unsympathetically that he might as well have been dragging me by the scruff of my neck. Wow! Wolfried shook his head at me, evidently disappointed. Weren't you told to avoid the royal family as much as possible? That's not her fault! She is freaking summoned by the royal family! You can't refuse that! Look, Wolfried, that part isn't my fault, at least. Okay, uh, that's gonna have to end it here. I'll see everybody in the next one.